welcome to the Industry Angel Podcast. We hear from the best business minds across the globe, entrepreneurs, social influencers, marketing mavens, and sales rock stars. We've got them all. Here comes your weekly dose of inspiration with your host, Ian Farah. Well, hello. We are live once again. This is a sneaky live, actually, because uh, we've only just organized this yesterday. I think it was yesterday. And we've got a really interesting guest for you who I recently met uh, over a drink or three. Coincidentally, that's what we're going to be talking about today because today's guest is owner of the Little Quaker Distillery. Along with his wife, Leanne, they started the multi-award winning Quaker Gin range in 2018 and have gone from strength to strength. Our guest's background is in manufacturing, having spent 24 years working in the woodwork industry. He moved to recycle plastics in lockdown last year and has also spent time as a director with Darlington Football Club. Learning to distill has added more strings to his bow and makes for some interesting stories, including the time he set fire to his kitchen. Welcome to the Industry Angel. Paul Coleman. Hi. What have you been doing? What's going on? Setting fire? <laughs> oh, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. So it was during the time when I was learning to be a distiller. I'd been down to Fulham and spent a couple of weeks learning to actually distill and, and the, the chemical process behind it and all the chemistry that goes with it and bought myself a little Chinese still, as you do when you're learning, keep the outlay as cheap as possible. And yeah, I got my cuts wrong and managed to um, set the side of the kitchen unit on fire. <laughs> Thankfully, um, that manufacturing background kicked in with health and safety and had the extinguisher and everything. But um, at that moment, I decided there and then that we the still that I was going to distill on was going to be electric and not gas. Good stuff. Excellent. Crazy. The good thing is I worked for a kitchen manufacturer, so I could uh, replace the units quite quickly. Jammy. Very jammy. <laughs> well, Paul, we're across Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, because there's our friend Grant there saying hello. So no pressure, my friend. All right. <laughs> so if anyone is watching, feel free to jump on and give your business a plug. And of course, ask Paul any questions around gin, distilling or setting fire to kitchens. I'm sure he'll uh, give you some tips. Uh, can I just jump in here? Director of Darlington Football Club, are you a huge fan yourself or? <laughs> Yes, yeah, very much so. So, um, as you, as you probably know, Darlington, born and bred, Quaker, Quaker town, Darlington, Little Quaker Distillery. That's sort of how the name of Little Quaker came about. Being a big fan of the football club, been there since I was a little boy. And yeah, 2012, when the club had, had been sort of liquidated and raised from the ashes, about a year later, I got involved as part of the supporters group and found myself on the board of directors, which gave me a real a real insight into how a football club runs and it was almost like playing champ manager for real which was interesting some of the chats with agents and managers and players and stuff like that some fantastic couple of years sky sports interviews a lot it was um it was brilliant and i stepped away and then went back again for a second bite of it just after we started little quaker and then with me moving jobs at the start of the lockdown it was like right lifestyle choice here gin football <laughs> work there has to be a work-life balance somewhere so i had to unfortunately step away but loved my time working on there and it was completely different to anything else i've ever experienced in business because that football passion takes hold of you yeah but it was really interesting the very first sentence you said was i found myself now isn't that isn't that so prevalent in business where you just find yourself like how yeah. did i get here how am i a trustee of this how did it rope me into that exactly yeah uh, and that's exactly how i ended up it was like because I was probably gobby about the football club and, and with my business background, could articulate myself in, in such a way that some of the fans were like, you need to be on there, you need to be doing this, you need to be doing that. And before you knew it, I was found myself elected onto the board and it's like, wow, how did, how did I end up here? Well, I'd just like to say, um, before we jump into this interview, we've got um, Karen saying hello. Okay, we've got Rebecca saying hello. Misha Steele saying hello, producer Misha. All fans of gin. Now, do, do, do you see what's happening here? We've got, well, just Grant, that's all. But all our lovely ladies joining us just because it's gin, hoping for a chance to taste a freebie, essentially. <laughs> but you do do tasting sessions, don't you, Paul? 
We do, yes. So um, we recently moved into premises in Darlington in Clark's Yard. And what that's allowed us to do is open the distillery doors up to the public, which we weren't able to do before with our previous residency at the bottom of my parents' garden. But um, So moving into Clark's Yard in a, in a wonderful building, it's like a 16th, 17th century building, loads of history. And now we do tasting sessions. So for £25, they can book in with us, come in and they taste four out of the six gins that we do. We pair it with the, the right tonic. We put the right garnish with it. I talk a bit about how gin came to prevalence in this country, how Little Quaker was born, so they get the backstory. I show them the still that we make it on, and, and they get you know a really good insight into what goes on in a distillery. And then at the end of it, we, we have a bit chat about which was the favourite, and then I pass the cocktail menu and send them behind the, the, the little bar that we've got upstairs in the tasting room, get the cocktail shaker out, and hashtag Quaker shakers, away we go. Wow, right, who's in? Who's in? <laughs> There's Rebecca there. I knew, I knew what would get today. Secret Santa. Well, that sounds good. Yeah, someone buy me that for a Secret Santa. Oh, that's clever. Yeah. Why don't we have an industry angel session where Paul takes us through the whole afternoon? That could be good. That would be great. Yeah. So we we, we dove straight in there, and what, what I heard that it was in here back garden recently as well. So let's take us right back to start, Paul. So yeah, so a little quick, how it came about was Leanne works for a very famous telecommunications company and she's been wanting to change careers for a long time and at the time we were members of a craft gin club where they sub you subscribe and they send you a bottle and a box each month so she came home one day particularly upset had a really rough day and saying i want to change but she because she's institutionalized she's been there that long it's very difficult to make that that career change me being the sympathetic husband that I once was like, well, you like all them gin. Why don't we start making gin as you do? You know where that idea came from. <laughs> I, I was enjoying reading the magazines and, and seeing all these craft distillers at the time down in Cornwall and in Yorkshire springing up left, right and centre. And I thought, how cool would that be to, to have one of them big copper stills and, and make your own gin? Didn't have a clue how to do it, but we sort of said a year from now, let's, let's, let's give ourselves a year. Let's look at how we do it, get the licences, see if we've got a business case, that sort of thing. And how the, the, the garden came about was I was sat around my parents one day looking out into the back garden and looking at this old brick wash house. That, uh, so my dad lives in the same house he was born in. And that wash house was where like my gran would do the washing when, when he was a kid and stuff. And so what's in there? And he's like, just your brother's bikes and, and, and scrap, really. I think we should turn it into a distillery. And he's like, well, if you want to do it, yeah. So, you know, that was their way of helping was to, to let me do that. The distillery was 2.1 meters by 1.6 wide. So you can imagine how really tight that was and, and how cozy it was, especially, you know, when you have an argument with your missus when you're working with her. It made for some very, very interesting evenings. <laughs> but, it, it, you know, at the time, it was it was the UK's smallest working distillery. And we, we tried to register it with Guinness Book of Records but we couldn't get that one over the line with them. But yeah, it, it was unofficially that the UK's smallest working distillery. And and the idea behind it was, look, let's start with low outgoings and, and make it work. And and it, and it did. It did as really well for the first 18 months. So that, that kind of idea to then, you built the distillery, you now start. How, how did you have the skills to produce the gin then? What, how, what, where was the training involved? So the, the, the training that I undertook was um, I went down to London uh, into Fulham and I met with a guy called Olivier Ward who's sort of involved with the Gin Guild and, and, and he does Sunday brunch with Simon Rimmer and Tim Lovejoy on a, on a Channel 4 on a Sunday morning. He comes on there and he talks about gin and I went down there and understood how do you open a distillery, what do you need to do, what do you need to learn and then from then it was just basically practice on, on the Chinese still, learning, reading, internet is obviously a great tool these days, speaking with people all over the world about how do you do this, how do you do that, YouTube videos, there's some, some great stuff on there, and, and episodes of Moonshiners on the Discovery Channel no hooked way. me, and I was like, that's the distiller that I want to be, something like that. So how do you how do you test them? You know, you, you said there about like it. It sounded like a bit of a, a, a sort of sand pit at the start where you you know you, you you're doing bits and bobs. What what's the test and how does that go through? Is it literally a taste test or using some sort of pH levels? I've got no idea, mate. Yeah, so you, you have a, a range of instruments that you can use, um, which test the the percentage of alcohol in in the gin or the the whiskey, whatever you're making, um, and and that's basically your barometer. You're using that to test what your alcohol content is. When it's coming off the stills, it starts coming off around 90 odd percent proof. 
So, you know, you imagine your, your average bottle of vodka or gin is usually around 37.5% to 40%. It's coming off the stills 80, 90, 95, 96 in some cases. So it's pretty potent stuff that comes off there. And it's taste. It really is. It's You know, yes, you can use different sorts of distillation methods and, and things like that. But for me, and being the distiller that I wanted to be, it was all about the taste and having that depth of, of flavour, complexity and, and quality in the produce. And the only way I could see to do that was to be tasting through the, the, the different stages of it coming off the distillation. So literally when it's 90% proof, you're tasting it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, when you, when I say I'm tasting it, I'm not sitting there gulping gallons of gin down. I'm literally <laughs> running my finger as, as it comes off. If you can imagine a bit like a tap running, mm-hmm. it's coming off there nice and slow. And, and I'm, I'm rubbing it into my fingers. I'm seeing how, um, what the viscosity of that liquid is, how is it sticky? Is it, has it got a, you know, any oils in it? And I'm tasting it just literally on the tip of my tongue, tasting it. And, and it's as simple as that. So, you know, it's, it's not like I'm gulping it down. It's just taste all taste and smell all the time. So how long does that procedure take then? It usually takes about four to six hours to run the gin. Um, and the rum is very similar, four to six hours. So it's not like a long process. Um, hmm. You can turn it around quite quickly. Obviously, we tend to go like six hours is, is probably the norm. So it makes for some long evenings, um, which is good fun. Though. It's, it's great fun. It's what I love. It's, it's a labor of love. And I find it so relaxing after a day at work. So it's good. So if Rebecca was having another party and she wanted a whole load of gin, she'd just reach out to you and say, look, I'm having a party the weekend. You could sort that out, couldn't you? You could get 25 bottles up, no bother. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, no problem. No problem whatsoever. How, how, how many gins is there? In, in the Quaker range. Mm-hmm. So we have six at the moment. So we have um, our original, which has um, won five awards. That's that one there. Yeah, uh-huh. nicely done. We've got props. Uh-huh. Yeah, and then we have some flavoured ones. So we've got a, a Sunshine, which is tropical flavours. We've got a Ruby Red, which is the real quirky one. That is infused with red wine and is a lovely deep red colour. We've got an Old Tom, which has just won an award in America. Um, we've got a Blueberry and we've got a Strawberry and Raspberry. So, the, yeah, there's six gins in total and at the minute two rums. So it's getting there. It's going well. What did you introduce the rum for? Because obviously, you know, gin, we've, we've heard a lot about gin. Is that is Are these trends now? Is that what you're following or...? Yeah, um, you know, everybody tried to tell us when we were starting out, friends, family, people in the industry said, you're too late to the party, the gin boom's gone. This was sort of like three years ago, um, three to four years ago when when we were developing the idea. But it hasn't been the case. Gin's just continued and, 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 you know, the trend, if anything, stronger than it's ever been. And very early into that process, I've always drank rum, always liked um, dark rums, spiced rums, etc. So I always wanted to create a rum for myself. And very early on in my novice days, I was experimenting with making rums as well as as gins so that I could understand how the different liquids and gins, et cetera, the processes that are different behind them and how they come off the stills differently. So I always wanted to bring that rum out. But at the same time, we kept reading in the industry about how the rum revolution was coming and people have been talking about the rum revolution, the rum revolution. It's here. It, you know, if you go down south now, the rum bars are vibrant and the amount of rums that are on the market now it's, it, you know, we've already seen the influx of flavoured rums. So the rum, rum revolution is here. I don't think it'll ever be as big as the gin boom that's been. But the idea behind our first rum, which was Black Diamond original, was I wanted to convert Leanne into liking rum because she didn't like rum. And I was like, that's a, the, if I can get people who are non-rum drinkers to start drinking it using our Black Diamond product, then that'd be great. And, and, and that's been successful. All my mates now drink my rum, which is amazing. Do they have mixers with it? some do there was two of us three of us sorry we did a bottle of it in 35 minutes with just ice because it's it's that nice (laughs) and then went out in the town afterwards and needless to say we didn't last long (laughs) well you know we would be nothing uh, if we didn't hear from our friend Bryn who's a friend of the show so in in terms of collaboration and there's a great point that you know Bryn chips in there how do you find the northeast network in terms of supporting each other then you know what it's really it's really good we're all competitive. We're all competitors against each other, um, but we've all got our own little niche as well. Mm-hmm. So there's some there's some really good, solid gin producers in the northeast, and the majority of the gin producers help each other out. You know, so um, I know Bryn's helped people out, and I, I talk with Bryn on, on a fairly regular basis, and we're about to do a, a collaboration together soon with himself and, and Scott from WL. I work with Stephen from Daisy over in Saltburn as well. 
you know, and he's helped me out loads of times with with bottles and things like that when we've been short and, and vice versa. And it's really good. It's a nice community. You know, there's no nastiness, no bitterness amongst the majority of people. Even the big boys, you know, likes of Durham, who are well established. John at Durham, you know, he's a great guy when you talk to him, very knowledgeable. So for all the competitors, we're always there to help each other out. You, you talked about the big guys there. So what's the, the dream for Little Quaker then? Is that where do you want to take this? So Little Quaker, the, the sort of the plan, the five-year plan that we, we started off with was year one, just get out there and, and start producing a good quality gin and get a reputation for producing a good quality gin. We ticked the box on that. By year three, we wanted to move to new premises. So we've done that. This is our, you know, October will be the anniversary of year three. So we've done that. And year four was about Leanne eventually, hopefully leaving her job full time. And, and running the business um, on a full-time basis. That process is starting. She's she's reducing her hours and, and going to four-day weeks now. So by the time we get to year five, year five was to establish the Little Quaker Distillery in Darlington and created a bit of a tourist attraction so people would come from outside of the town for the gin tastings, to buy our gins, to spend the afternoon learning about how we distill. And then obviously from there, we can hopefully grow and grow. We look at the likes of Masons as our, they're our benchmark. They're, they're the guys who, you know, if, if we could ever aspire to be like anybody, it would probably be Masons who are a husband and wife team who've just gone from strength to strength to strength and grown and grown and grown. And they've probably got four or five years on us in terms of their maturity of their brand, et cetera. But to hold them up as they're the guys that we aspire to be. So that's where Little Quaker, you know, if, if I could have it go anywhere, it would be similar sort of size to that. In terms of revenue streams then, Paul, you've got gin sales, so bottles of gin. So is this business to business or business to consumer or both? Both. We do B2B, B2C. I would have said before lockdown, we were probably 70% B2B into the bars, the restaurants. Lockdown, literally overnight, that revenue stream went and we had to reestablish ourselves with the retail consumer. The internet and, and the live Zoom calls and things like that really open things up for us. So we do a lot of live tastings and live tasting sessions with people all over the UK now, um, using a lot of different networks. And that's been really good. So we have you know, little pockets of um, sales going on at the minute. We've got a, a little vibe going on down in Bristol. We've got a good one going on in London, and we've got one going on in Ipswich, which obviously people discover us on these live tastings, they buy a bottle and then they have their little friends around in the gardens and showing off the, the bars and stuff that they've built. And then they, they get a bottle a little quicker out and you can just see how it's starting to snowball because all of a sudden you get two or three more orders for addresses that are almost in the same region. And you put in the postcode in with your courier like, didn't we deliver here the other week? Oh no, it's next door. Ah, oh, right. Okay. So yeah, we, th that's been great for us. So that online tasting then, so is that you literally online with your range of gins and then they're at home with the same range and you say, right, okay, take that bottle now, I'm going to... Yeah, pretty much what we do, we use the little minis, so the little 5CL minis and we create a little tasting pack. So they would buy the tasting pack for say, 20, 25 pounds and they get three minis, they get the tonic, we send the garnish with them, we set the Zoom call up and we basically do a mini version of what we do in the distillery and, and we take them through the tastings we, we'd educate them on why we pair the certain tonics with it and we just chat about it and, and, and talk to them about what they're going to taste you know gin tasting notes they're going to feel you know what botanicals they're going to they're going to smell they're going to taste and just educate them really on our brand and it's you know it's, it's really good and it's fantastic and now that we've got the distillery we can do them live from the distillery as well well i'm just going to say that to you your revenue streams were well, b2b b2c and now you've got this you know, coming in and doing live. How's that? Are we okay to do that now? COVID times, you can get them in there now? Yes. Yeah. So now since since we started in and it was like June, we could start having tables of six and things like that. Now um, the restrictions have been lifted. It's, um, yeah, we, we, we usually, we recommend between eight and 10 at a time. Um, because anything more that we can get up to 15 when you're getting up to 15 it's a very difficult room to try and work you can imagine 15 is, you know it's usually predominantly women who come to it but 15 women three or four gin and tonics trying to control them and talk to them and keep them keep them all interested it's very difficult so we recommend eight to ten as a maximum but we do it we, you know we have had sessions where we've had two people and it's been you know husband and wife on a date it's a really intimate session so we can sit down and we can talk to them but yeah about eight eight to ten is a good number because you get a good atmosphere going um you get lots of questions and yeah really good atmosphere 
and, and, and the gin tastings are really taking off, really, really popular. I think we're booked up. The rest of September's already booked and three quarters of October's already booked up. Wow. Which is good. It's good. Does this feed into the R and D then for, for what you, you guys want to do? So people say actually, have you not got this gin or I've been tasting a gin that's like that and you taking ideas as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we have like on the racking in the distillery, there's a top shelf there and everyone always comments, what's them up there? And I'm like, well, they're my experiments. <laughs> so I have things like whiskies and I have um, different rums up there and obviously gins as well. And they're always asking me about what's that one? What's this one? And, and as you say there, people are asking what, you know, what's missing from our range? What do we do? And it gives us good ideas as well. And it's also an opportunity as well. You know, if I've got something that I want to experiment, how it's going to go down, it's a good opportunity in a tasting session where you've got you know, half a dozen to 10 people to give them a little sample and go, what do you think of this? This is a new one that I'm working on and just get some feedback. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's a great opportunity for that. So when you started this business how long how long ago paul was it so the idea started in february 2017 but we actually didn't get didn't register the business till february 2018 and we actually didn't start trading with the license and everything until october 2018 so we're just shy of three years now so in terms of starting that business then what, what was the runway like for for you to obviously uh invest in the equipment the the raw materials you know, and then start producing, you know, some, some turnover back and then paying yourselves a salary and that sort of stuff. How, how did that, how did that go? What was the plans around that? So the plans behind that was obviously that we didn't, and we, we didn't want to commit loads of financial support to the business to begin with in case it was going to fail. You know, I had zero experience as a distiller, so I didn't even know if I could even do this, but as we started to develop the batches and, and understand what we were creating, we did a crowdfunding. So we said we needed to raise sort of £8,000 would give us the ballpark for what we needed to convert the, the distillery and get the, the first stills in and the botanicals and everything. And I think we, we successfully raised that. We created a bunch of people who are still with us now. So some of those crowdfunders have been on the journey the whole way and still purchase from us. And it's fantastic when you meet somebody for the first time and they go, oh, by the way, I was one of your original crowdfunders. And like, wow, really? Wow, thank you so much. Um, so that that helped establish us with not just people in Darlington, but people outside of Darlington. So there's people all over the UK um, who bought into that that dream that we had. And, that, and that's really helped us um, establish ourselves all over the UK, which is good. Did, did anyone help you at that particular period, Paul? Any support agencies or anything like that? Not at the time, because one of the things that sort of hindered us a little bit was with me working in industry or the same industry for so long, I hadn't sort of developed the network and, and you know, with like BNI and, and, and the, the chambers and people like that. So I didn't really have the knowledge to go into them and, and work out what funding was available and stuff like that. If I could do it again now, it would be probably completely different because I could access funding from Tees Valley and stuff like that. And we certainly tapped into some of that when it came to moving to, to Clark's Yard and, and made use of the, the European funding that was available. So, yeah, it wasn't it just wasn't available to us just purely down to the fact that we didn't have a business mentor and we didn't know who to who to tap into. Um, that obviously came later. Um, so, yeah, it was quite difficult to to set it up. But at the same time. It was a side hustle. It was, let's see how this develops. By not committing too much financially to it, we knew that, you know, if it didn't work and it didn't succeed, we hadn't lost anything. Um, so it was worth the gamble. You mentioned mentorship before there, Paul. So have you, have you got a mentor at the moment or is that just people within your network that you kind of lean on? It's people in the network that I lean on, other distilleries, looking at other business models. Yeah. But yeah, I, I tend to bounce ideas off Chris at one more than two brew in South Shields because we just we yeah, just good luck with that yeah I know <laughs> it's good fun it's good fun <laughs> but we just we, we, we just come up with some crazy ideas and um yeah <laughs> less said about some of them crazy ideas are better but no <laughs> you know that there's there's different people in different industries that I bounce off and um spark ideas all the time the problem is you have that many ideas and you want to run at 100 mile an hour but at the same time it's again it's about picking out what is the right thing to do We're working full time in a in another industry and doing this on an evening and on a weekend and things like that, it takes up a lot of time i i've got to rein myself in sometimes because it's got to be a slow burner and if i let myself get carried away then i'm going to put myself in a position where the work life balance becomes a problem again so it is a slow burner and it was always a five year 
plan that we set out deliberately knowing that we both work full time. You must have had people giving you advice whether that was what you asked for or whether they just gave you it without even you wanting it. Uh, what, what kind of advice did you get in the early stages, you know, both good and bad? Good advice was about making sure that our product was good, making sure that our branding was good, um, make sure that we are present on social media. And, and I have to be honest, when I first set out on this journey, I was on social media, Facebook, Twitter, all that sort of stuff. But I hadn't appreciated the work that goes into social media and social media marketing. And you know, you see a lot of these digital marketing companies um, my personal opinion at the time was money for old rope that throwing a few tweets out there. How, how, how dare they change? I know. Thanks well, that, that, that's, you know, I'm trying to run a business doing this. That's where I, <laughs> that's where I was. And that was my perception of it. It really was. But when you yeah. have a business and you start to do it, you realize how difficult it is to do social media, to come up with new ideas, to keep it fresh. Yeah. And now I appreciate the, the work that the digital marketing companies do to do all that work as well as run the business is very difficult it's very difficult and that's what we're starting to experiment with now is start to look at the next stages okay what do we do with the digital market inside of it what what where can we take this what can we do and starting to build a network of people like yourself and, and other people in the industry and start to pick their brains and, and go okay for next year we need a marketing budget that we can use people like yourself and other people to to help us. I think that's the thing that's probably educated me when people were telling me about you need a good brand image and you need good strong digital media. I just didn't see it until I had until I had my own business. Yeah, it, it's funny running the business, Paul. As you know, you kind of got these peaks and troughs. So I put you on the spot here, and I, I hope you don't mind personally. Do you, have you had those kind of sleepless nights where you just think, you know, should we just pack this in, or it's getting too much, or I'm, I'm out of my depth, or anything like that? Yeah, constantly, constantly. <laughs> I'm one of these people that lives on four to five hours sleep a night. Um, okay. And I need to because <laughs> of the amount of stuff that we do. And there are many occasions where we either get very busy, and you think to yourself, this is we can't do this. This is killing me. I can't do it. Then you get comments back that tell you how amazing your gin is and, and the rewards that you get from that i think there's an advert not so long back on the radio where i think someone's talking about every time they get a sale it, they get a notification on the phone and what that does to them inside and that was so true and i think that's the sort of th the buzz that keeps you going but yeah we you know there's many occasion where you know you don't get a sale for a couple of days and you think to yourself this isn't working i'm putting all this effort in you look at you know you, you've had a lot of expenditure one month and the profit's not there and you're like what do i do and especially during lockdown when you know when boris locked us down and the pub shut we looked at it and went is this probably the chance we've got to get out and, and say do we stop or do you know or do we change things a little bit do we, you know what what should we do leanne more than me is probably in that position where her glass is half empty, my glass is half full. Um, so we work quite well together to bounce off each other. It's, it's funny, we do a market a stall or a food festival, and if I haven't sold at least three or four bottles in the first half hour, I'm, I'm, I'm quite pessimistic about the stall going, it's not, go, it's not working today, it's not working. And she's quite optimistic going, it's early days, give it a chance. Yet in the rest of the business, it's the dynamics the other way around. I was just going to say that in terms of business, then, is it pretty much a, an easy split? Like you take care of the finances, the, the, the social media, I'll do the distal. Do you do it that way? Yeah, very much so. It is, it is a real team effort. And I think it's not just in the business sense as well. It's in the home as well. You know, so um, tonight, for example, I'm going to finish work this afternoon at sort of 5, 5.30 and I'll drive straight down to Darlington and get changed and go straight down the distillery and I'll be distilling until 11, 12 o'clock tonight to get some stock down following the festival last week. And OK, Leanne's not in the distillery distilling, but she's actually looking after the family home and making sure that the family home works and dealing with some orders and, and, and stuff like that. So it is very much a team effort and, you know, um, labelling and stuff like that. We just work together and go, okay, what needs doing? What do we need to do? Answering messages that are coming in all the time is a real team effort. Um, so, yeah, you know, there's, there's lots of – the only thing that I would say is bespoke to me is the distilling itself. Everything else we share amongst ourselves. Um, the tastings, again, is predominantly me, but Leanne is growing in confidence to be able to start doing them as well. I think we said on this show a number of times that the trend tends to be that we want to look after businesses like yours, Paul, 
we want to see where our money goes and whose pockets rather than you know the, the big boys these these big corporate giants if you heard something similar to any of your customers where they enjoy the, it being a real like, kind of artisan family run business uh yeah i mean I, I think we saw a big change during lockdown yeah so we were during lockdown we were refurbishing the the, the building that we'd rented so literally we signed the lease deal on the day that Boris locked us all down at 5 p.m. And it was like, oh, what have we done? But we then decided to just take the time. And we used to see people coming down on a on a Saturday morning. They'd come down and you'd see the same sort of demographic of people. It's all these people who said they supported local but didn't really. Okay. It was like a, it's a nice trend to support local. But during lockdown, I think yeah. they were almost forced to support the local guys because the big yeah. brands yeah. Were, were shut and things like that. They educated themselves, especially with with the drinks industry. A lot of people educated themselves on what was a good quality spirit. And I think uh, you hit the nail on the head there. They want to know what goes in their product. They want to know where it's coming from, what's involved in the process. And we've seen a lot of that this last sort of six months. People coming in, they want to know what botanicals are in there. They want to know how we distill it. You know, and that's a great for us because there's a hook for the tasting rooms. Like, come on the gin tasting, you'll get to learn all about it. But they're really interested. And I think that whole trend of supporting local was, to a lot of people, was a, yeah, I like to support local because it was a trendy thing to say. But during lockdown, they've actually started doing it. And I think as we've come out of lockdown, people do want to support local. And that's something we've seen on the food festivals. Certainly last weekend, a lot of people came and supported us because they wanted to support local businesses and see the local guys succeed. And I think the high street has to. That's you know that's the only way the high street's going to have a future is the small artisan ventures, people in shops like ourselves. And if you, you, know, if you come into Clark's Yard on a Saturday morning, it is so vibrant. It's unbelievable. We've got artisan gin getting distilled in, in, in our building. You've got a cheese and wine shop with some really quality produce you've got an artisan baker you've got this wonderful coffee shop that's quirky with star wars figures and everything in it and it's really different to anything else the yard is just beautiful now so it's very similar to the shambles in york and what's been created is this wonderful small business artisan community and everyone supports each other as well so it, it's it's i think lockdown in that respect has really forced people to to appreciate the local guys yeah, I'll have to come along. It sounds great. Mm. I just thinking there, I, I bought my mother a, um, a non-alcoholic gin. And when I was doing that, I, I noticed there was quite a lot. Have you, have you noticed that there's a trend for non-alcoholic spirits now? It, it has, yes. It was always like your, your 0% lagers, wasn't it, In, in mm-hmm. that you used to get, your, your Bex and, and, and a few others, Heineken's, etc. But I think over the last year, there has been a, a trend towards it. It's not something that we want to do or feel the need to do just yet but you know everything's got a place in the market and yeah you've seen a big change in it how popular they're going to be i think we'll see we'll see whether it's just a trend that's passing again it goes back to what i was saying about people have educated themselves during lockdown and they're more demanding now in terms of what they want they're not prepared to just go out to a pub and because they're driving or they don't drink satisfied with half a diet coke anymore yeah so i'm just Mindful of the time there, because I know, I know you've got gin to uh, to distill. Where can we find you, Paul? Come on, give us a give us the big right hook here. Where should we? Where can we go? What's the website? Okay, so the website is littlequakerdistillery.co.uk. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter at Little Quaker Gin. We're on Instagram. We've even started our TikTok channel now. Getting down with the kids <laughs> and. Hopefully in the next few months, we'll start a YouTube channel as well, because it'd be good to show some content when we're distilling and stuff like that and do a few masterclasses. Yeah, behind the scenes stuff works really well. Exactly. And and see me with my moonshine still and stuff like that. Well, I'm hoping to put an event on in October with our friend of the show, Tony Robinson, OBAs at at the brewery as well, at one more than two here in South Shields. So uh, fantastic! maybe we could incorporate a a gin tasting session in there as well. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I'm always up for coming up to Shields and visiting Chris's brewery. (laughs) <laughs> good stuff. I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna try and do a collab for Christmas again. So we okay. did a we did a beer last year using the rum from from Little Quaker and, mm-hmm. and Brew Lab and, and Chris. And I think we're uh, we're set to do it again this year. So keep an eye out for that one. Yeah, that was their Christmas pudding in a bottle, wasn't it? It was lovely. Oh, unbelievable! Yeah, really impressive that one. So looking forward to that one. 
Good man. Well, Paul, I've really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for your, your transparency, your open honesty. It's good for new businesses to hear journeys like yours. And as we said earlier on, to be able to support businesses like yours. So that website, one more time before you go. Littlequakerdistillery.co.uk. Wonderful stuff, Paul. Well, all the best for the future. And I hope to, uh, to see you soon up here in South Shields. Brilliant. Cheers, Ian. Thanks very much. There you go. That was our Paul there. I hope you enjoyed that. Obviously, the ladies did. <laughs> and uh, very much Rebecca. Obviously, she stayed right the way through for the interview because Jane's her thing. Um, this will be there on Catch Up. So feel free to share the show and, and help out businesses likes of Paul's and mine and the podcast get seen because, you know, we're hustling really hard as small businesses and there's lots of the bigger boys out there. So, you know, support local, support us small indie casters and small artisan businesses likes of Paul's. Go to the website, maybe even book yourself on one of those gin tasting sessions. That could be good if we all do it, couldn't it? Maybe we could organise that. So we have got a couple of lives lined up, I think maybe for the next couple of weeks, once a week, we might be going live as well. So keep an eye out for that. I know we throw them up pretty quickly, don't we? So uh, thanks for jumping in and watching. But as I say, you can watch on catch up when you're ready to go. Okay, then. Well, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you very soon. You take care now.